All right, all right, all right. God bless each and every one of you out there in Christ Jesus. And as I always say, uh, those that are not within the parameters, within the the safety, within the the covenant of God, God desires that you let down the the corruptions of the world and to come into the manifold grace of God, manifold power and renewal that God ultimately wants to do uh, in those that uh, choose him. The word of God tells us in the book of uh, in the book of uh, Joshua that choose this day whom you will serve. And God is enabling people to do that, to choose this day to to ultimately uh, in them to choose because he is really chosen them even before they chose him. So uh so as we you know continue concerning this uh uh bible series this holy uh bible journey series we want to uh, uncover more truths uncover more of what the word of god is declaring in reference to this powerful book this book of joshua i am so excited i'm ready to just ultimately unload in reference to a multitude of truths and and different things that we see through the text that would enable us to be encouraged as far as the sons and daughters of God to be encouraged and to go forward in the direction that God is ordaining for his sons and daughters to go. And so so <laughs> this book there's so much about it. So one of the first things that I wanted to say is that uh, right at the beginning, we see that Joshua is the individual that God has chosen to replace Moses. Moses, mighty man of God, had passed away uh, and, you know, he had done a mighty work in reference to what God had ordained him to accomplish and to do. Uh, and of course, God received the glory in the end. God received the glory in the sense that there was a multitude of miracles, a multitude of things that were done that were evidence of the God of all creation and the fact that he was giving to these chosen people a promised choice land that would ultimately uh, be uh in a sense, in their possession until the day that he returns. So there's a a future plan of God in reference to this land, that this choice land that God had given to the children of Israel. And there's a, a temporary or a, a present day, uh, you know, uh, a present day uh, aspect of, of what the land is to be used for a, a blessing that it should be to the people in which God had given it to. Uh, and so Joshua is on the verge of the this 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 beginning to take the very land uh, across the Jordan, because we know that according to uh, the past few episodes, uh, we've been talking about how the children of Israel had already started to take land, how God had already started to uh, to fulfill prophecy in reference to what we talked about before. Uh, uh, Genesis 15 uh, uh, verses 16, 17 and 18 in reference to the fulfillment of what God had promised Abraham and what God was going to ultimately do to bring the reality of that promise uh, that he gave to Abraham to fruition, to actually bring that to light. And so uh, that was an amazing, uh, uh, so, so, it, we, so we talked about in the past couple books how uh, in the, the book of uh, uh, Deuteronomy in the book of Numbers, Deuteronomy, where we begin to 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 see the reality of the possession of these lands, and so there were uh, specific kings, Sihon, uh, you know, th th this Amorite king, and another Amorite king, Og, um, uh, king of Bashan, that uh, ultimately 
uh, fell to Israel. Israel took their lands, uh, 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 ultimately took their lands because their lands uh, were not for them anymore. There was a fulfillment of the prophecy in reference to the people in that area that God were going to take from that area and, and ultimately give the land to the Israelites, his people. And, and so, and, and, and just so we, uh, you know, further, you know, explain, uh, in reference to what we, you know, we're talking about last time, you know, the children of Israel were the judgment on the people of the land that ultimately were committing abominations and all sorts of atrocities for a very long time, for for hundreds of years, centuries, maybe even millennia. These people were doing all sorts of things that were uh, against the laws of God, against the ways of God. And God ultimately want to bring about judgment because God is just. So God brings about the the taking away of what offends in the land to then implant what is good. And so he wants the children of Israel, as we were talking about last time as well, not to emulate, not to recreate, not to fashion themselves according to the foreign uh, aspects of the world, the foreign aspects uh, uh, of uh, the lands around them, or even the native aspects of Egypt that they have come from. God doesn't want to uh, want his own uh, people that he chooses to uh, relate, replace the people that are in the land. He doesn't want them to recreate the abominable acts and mindsets and behavior that he ultimately uh took those people, those foreign people out of the land for. And so, so they were the judgment against the darkness that was in the land. Uh, and so, so the king of, uh, uh, uh Sihon, the, the, the king, the Amorite king and the other Amorite king, um, Og of Bashan. So, so we see those lands again, we were talking about those lands that were, uh, that were east of Jordan, that those lands that were east of Jordan, those lands were given to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the, uh, and the half-tribe Manasseh. And so there was something important that Joshua restated, that Joshua obviously got from Moses in reference to the fact that the, the these tribes had to... Uh, ensure that the men of war from these tribes would continue on beyond the river Jordan, but their families, their wives, their children, their livestock could stay back and populate those lands uh, so that, you know, the lands have inhabitants, so that the lands uh, could be begin to be uh, tilled, you know, so that it can be fashioned after the nature, after the design, after the instruction of the Lord. And so these lands were now possessions of the Lord, possessions of the children that are of the uh, uh, that are of Israel, the, the, the children of Israel, they, they, these lands are their possession. Uh, and, and, and what God said that they would inherit, they would inherit those physical lands. And so, so the blessing were on the children of Israel, the, the identity are on the children of Israel. And so in the chapter, in chapter one, uh, God is also affirming Joshua. God wants to affirm Joshua. God wants to, to strengthen Joshua. We see uh, numerous times in chapter one that there's a uh, be strong and have a good courage. Be strong and have a good courage. Un yes, the task before you is great. Yes, the task before you is something beyond your comprehension or your imagination. But 
God is trying to instruct Joshua to to understand that if he obeys, that no one can destroy what he's ordained to get. No one can hinder him or stop the plan of God on his life if he continues in obedience. And so there's an adherence to the law of God, the, the this law that they've gotten. You know, throughout the last couple of episodes, we talked about the different laws. We talked about the the the, the fact that that God wanted to make these individuals righteous, even in warfare. He wanted to make them righteous. He wanted to ensure that they act and behave in ways that reflected higher laws that come even from the throne room of heaven, come from the identity of God. And so these higher laws are, uh, are, are things that are represented in certain ways in the lower laws that the children of Israel are following. And so this uh, is important that Joshua receives this encouragement, that he understands that he ought to uh, abide uh, according to the words of God, that he ought to uh, meditate on these things day and night, that he ought to uh, you know, obey and, you know, ultimately receive the the blessings and the benefits that come from obedience. And so Joshua is being told and, and Joshua begins to tell Israel, the, the 12 tribes, the, the Levites and the, the priests, he begins to tell all of them to be strong and of a good courage as he is receiving encouragement from God. And so we see in, in chapter one, that there's instruction, that there will be the going over Jordan. And, and so you, you be, there, uh, there's the leaders, uh, the officers, the uh, men, the elders that are, you know, over uh, these tribes, the, the specific authorities. They ultimately communicate to the people what Joshua commands them. And they begin to communicate, yes, that they uh, have to uh, prepare themselves, that they have to pre prepare themselves because God is ultimately going to do a miracle on their behalf. God is going to ultimately promote uh, the, the, the identity, promote the authority that is on uh, uh, Joshua, before their eyes, he, he wants to uh, ensure that they know that the God of Israel has not left, but that he is still present and he's working through Joshua and he's uh, empowering Joshua so that Joshua can be the leader to ultimately advance this great mission that the Israelites have to ultimately uh, accomplish. Uh, and so, uh, so as we look at um, more of chapter uh, one here, we, we see that there's an importance in, as we were talking about, the uh, some of, uh, as the, uh, the, the men of war, how they had to journey beyond, that, that they couldn't stay with their families. They had to journey beyond the river because there's an importance in helping the other tribes to ultimately gain their rest, to gain uh, their territories through warfare, through uh, what God uh, wants them to do to obtain the rights, the authority to, to, to control the territories. And so there's a need for the men, the men of war, to go and assemble with the other men of war of the other tribes to pass beyond the river Jordan so that they can, uh, you know, ultimately get what God wants them to obtain as far as the, the territory and the lands. And so the, the, the lands begin to hear. So news begins to spread, you know, uh, about uh, these, you know, out of nowhere children of Israel that wander through the desert and, and finally uh, have marched themselves right before this Jordan River. Uh, and and so they're heading westward. They're heading they're heading westward 
Um, you know, and and so now, the, so news is spreading. People are getting anxious. People are uh, full of fear. There's uh, so much. Uh, that's happening. So obviously there are people on the outskirts that are watching this population of people move throughout the wilderness, watching them as they are, you know, uh, in the area uh, of, of Shittim, uh, you know, in, uh, you know, around the plains of Moab, uh, you know, and, and as they move, as they gather up the tabernacle, as we talked about, in recent episodes, gathering up the tabernacle and the different appointed officials uh, that uh, the Levites, the, the Levite officials that are um, that that have to uh, do specific things, uh, and in the right order, you have, as we talked about before, the uh, the uh, Gershonites that are responsible for the outer layer. Um, of the tabernacle, uh, and you have the uh, Kohathites that are responsible uh, for the holy things that are within the tabernacle. And of course, they can't touch them until the priests cover them and ensure that it's done in the right fashion. And, and of course, you have the Morarites that take up the structure, take up the structure of the tabernacle and ensure that, that you know, uh, is um, in position to then uh, travel wherever they would encamp next. And so as we go to uh, chapter two, uh, we, you know, begin to see that, you know, there is a, uh, the, the need for more spies to go out. So there's two spies that go out uh, from Shittim, from where they are, from this camping ground that they are. So they have not gone uh, directly before the Jordan River yet, but they're about to, uh, and they're preparing the people to journey, to do so. And so you have these two spies in the beginning, uh, in the beginning of uh, chapter two of Joshua, these two spies, they go out and they, uh, they they meet this woman Rahab. They meet this the the, the woman. She she's called Rahab the harlot. Uh, obviously, her occupation is that. Uh, and uh, but even though she uh, is a woman of you know as some may say uh, ill repute per se she's going to be ultimately saved. She sees a way out of this lifestyle that she does not favor, that she, that she does not want. She sees uh, the, the, the hand of God. She sees a, a, a path that she can take that would be beneficial for herself and her family. And so, so you have these uh, two spies, uh, these, these spies are not named, but these two spies go out and, of course, they're seen by um, other uh, individuals in Jericho. You know, so, so they journey beyond the, the uh, river, the, this River Jordan, how they got over, whether they crossed over in a uh, shallow uh, spot uh, where the fords were, because that's what fords are. Fords are the the place uh, in which uh, people may build uh, uh, some measure of, of bridge, or maybe if there's a shallow spot to where uh, people can cross over or whatnot. So they had to, so the, the, the miraculous uh, uh, parting of the Jordan River uh, wasn't allocated to them at that time. They had to make their way across this Jordan River in order to go and spy on Jericho. So they go and spy on Jericho, meet Rahab. Uh, you know, Rahab takes them in. Rahab sees the, her way out. She takes them in. And uh, so obviously there's individuals that see th their uh, uh conversation or see them from afar sees that Rahab um, is interacting with them and so uh, these messengers these people they go back to the king of Jericho and so they tell the king that uh, this woman Rahab Rahab the harlot 
was seen talking with these uh, individuals, these two suspicious characters. They look like they are part of the, the very people that we are afraid of, the children of Israel uh, that we've heard so much about that came from Egypt that split the Red Sea. And so they're like, oh, hang, hang on here. So the king uh, wants to uh, go uh, and have these uh, uh, servants, has specific servants go and uh, apprehend these two spies, these two spies from uh, Israel. Uh, and so what we see is uh, Rahab is given a message by spies. Rahab is given a message and that the spies um, are protected. The, spy, the spies um, of Israel are protected by Rahab. She makes a decision to protect these individuals because this is her lifeline. So she makes it she makes a plan within herself to lie to the messengers of the king so she tells the messengers of the king that hey i don't know where these men have gone you know it's possible that they you know at the the at the closing of the the gates of the city at sundown it's possible that they had already you know left uh, through the gate and so you should go and you should rush and go and pursue them because you can um, go ahead and overtake them because you know you can you know uh, run on foot or 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 get to them before they get back to where they have come from um, and so she makes up this elaborate story in order to uh, uh, get uh, get these messengers that came from the king away from her and her plan, her plan and her way out. So, so then we see that she begins, because she hides these spies, these Israelite spies, she hides them. Uh, so as she, you know, tells the other people a story and they go off looking for the spies, you know, beyond the gates and all the way to the, uh, the fords before the river, uh, she, uh, she is trying to make a deal. She's trying to make a deal with these Israelites and she wants them to protect her and her family because she is ultimately describing the fact that all of Jericho, all of the people have heard. We've, uh, gotten news reports from individuals that, um, have seen live, that uh, uh, have witnessed um, uh, certain things and, and, and that, that the God of Israel has done for his people. And so this news has traveled and now it's spread throughout all of Jericho and the king and all of the people are afraid. And so what's being said is uh, by uh, Rahab, uh, furthermore, is that she wants a way out and she wants for them to promise her that when the God of Israel, when this mighty God that she believes is the, the true God of all creation, when this God, when this God gives uh, them Jericho, gives them the land, she wants for her and her family to be rescued, to be saved, to not succumb to the punishment uh, that the entire city, that the people, the inhabitants will come to. Uh, so she wants a way out. And so, so they agree, they agree. And so one of the uh, things that as I was reading uh, um, the word of God, as I, was, as I was reading the book of Joshua the past few days, I, I caught something that I don't believe I ever caught before. Uh, and one of the uh, comparisons that I uh, was seeing that I believe the Lord was just allowing me to see uh, because of the importance of this bridging of the gap. And so this bridging of the gap is, is, is the concept or what we see about 
Passover and what we know the spies told uh, Rahab to do as a sign for her deliverance, as a sign for her salvation. And so when we look at Passover, it it tells us um, in Exodus thir- uh, yes, Exodus 13, we see that there's the, uh, the, the choosing of a lamb and blood that's taken from that lamb. And there is the wiping of the blood on the door, the doorpost, on the right, left doorpost, and on the top, um, lintel, doorpost. And, and so, so when we look at that and what that meant in reference to the fact that the angel of death would pass over anyone um, that had that blood on their door. And so that was something extremely important for them to evade death. And so when we look at Rahab's story, we see that the two spies instructed her to take a scarlet uh, rope, a scarlet rope. And it's, it's no coincidence that it's scarlet, which is the color of blood or a reddish purplish purplish color so it's no coincidence that it's 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 not black that they told her to hang out of her window it's not green it's not yellow it was scarlet that was told to rahab to hang from her window and so this was her passover in a sense it was her passover in the sense that uh, on her window was a marking. And so that was, so the angel of death, in a sense, the children of Israel, who were the judgment on Jericho, right, were to pass over her, were to save her rather than destroying her. And so that was an awesome comparison just in reference to what God does in reference to how he, in a sense, legally saved Rahab. He, he threw a, a, a specific example in what he did for the children of Israel in order for the angel of death to over, to pass over them and not kill them, not kill their firstborn and not kill their, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the first of their flock or whatnot, not kill it, but to rescue them in reference to the Passover on this side in Exodus 13. And uh, as we see in Joshua chapter 2, for uh, Rahab uh, to be instructed on what would happen uh, in order, uh, and what needs to happen in order for her to receive salvation, not just her, but her entire household. And so that was uh, something that was important to see because God is 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 handing out in a sense uh the opportunity for her to be saved she was supposed to die along with all of the other people that were from jericho but because she risked her life because she agreed with the god of israel because she uh went to any extent to do what god would have wanted her to do in reference to the agreement of the mission, the mission that the Israelites had to accomplish. She was rewarded. Her family was was rewarded for that. And she's in the history books uh, for that. And so uh, I wanted to look at um, where it speaks of that in uh, speaks of her act of 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 of, of justified works in uh, James, James chapter two, verse 25. Um, here it says, likewise also, cause you know, James here is talking about, uh, 
you know, uh, faith without works being dead. And he's talking about the fact that faith is not just in our minds or intellectual. Faith is something that's exhibited by action. It's, ex it's exhibited by justified works of obedience. And so here uh, in verse 25, it says, Likewise, also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had them uh, had sent them out another way. And so uh, James is talking about these righteous acts, these acts uh, that she 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 concocted this plan uh, in in the hiding um, of of these people. And she sent, you know, the the other messengers um, you know, on a wild goose chase, you know, she, she, she did what was necessary so that she can bring about salvation to her household. And so that was mighty in reference to what God wanted Rahab to exhibit. And so because of that, we see that she's a, 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 a good proverb, uh, in, in, throughout history. We see that her, this reference of Rahab is being used, um, in the book of James in the New Testament. And so, so, so we're seeing the reality of the, the mission on the Israelites coming to pass. Uh, we see them, uh, doing you know, what Joshua learned from Moses and Joshua, Moses sent spies, God, uh, uh, Moses sent spies by God's, uh, uh, instruction. And so, so we see, um, you know, uh, Joshua, you know, ultimately sending spies, uh, into the land. Uh, and so, so now the, the, so now she also instruct so Rahab instructs the spies because the spies are hid on her roof uh and, and so she's trying to instruct them in what to do and she tells them hey um go out and hide in a mountain for a time for three days specifically and ensure that uh, you stay for three days so that the pursuers, the people that I caused to go on a wild goose chase, so that those people can come back after the fruitless efforts of their journey. And so they go out even onto the fords, even onto the the the, the place where, uh, you know, maybe people have built things or the river is shallow in certain areas or, or something in order for people to cross the Jordan River. Uh, but we know that God is going to do a super, super and miraculous work in the separating of these waters ultimately so that the entire a uh, massive number of the Israelites for them to cross over uh, by his his provision, uh, according to what he has said that he would do in the likeness of what he did with uh, Moses and the separating or the parting of the Red Sea. And so we, we see that uh, the spies eventually make it back. They eventually make it back and they're talking to Moses I'm sorry, they're talking to Joshua, Joshua, you know, Moses, Joshua, they're a powerful men of God. And so they're, they're, so the spies, the two spies, they go back and they're talking to Joshua and they're telling Joshua that, uh, they're telling Joshua what Rahab told them in reference to the fact of all of Jericho being overtaken with fear, being overtaken with the dread, uh, with what uh, they know is going to happen. And so they're, they're scrambling, trying to find uh, ways for them to evade, you know, what's, what, what they perceive is coming because of what Rahab 
uh, told them in reference to the news that all of the country, all of Jericho heard about what happened to Sihon and to Og. And so they heard that, you know, the, is the Israelites have all of that land on the outside of the river Jordan, that all of that is for the Israelites. And so we talked about the three tribes that obtain those lands. And so now they are afraid. And uh, so Joshua, uh, upon hearing this news, he's going to ultimately continue, uh, the, the forward moving of the the mission to ultimately dismantle these nations that are ultimately uh abominations before god and so we see that um, that um joshua begins to uh, tell them to consecrate themselves in chapter three uh to to get ready to uh, you know, Joshua's, uh, uh, you know, ensuring in, in, in that all of Israel knows through the officers and the individuals, the uh, 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 people that are over the other people that are in charge of making sure that everyone knows. And so there's uh, an importance for a specific structure to manifest. And so we know the structure obviously comes from God, the way that they're going to cross uh, the river uh, Jordan. And in chapter three, so as you know, these officers are given uh, instruction of Joshua and the officers tell the people that the people are being uh, told that there's uh, going, they're ultimately going to all cross uh, the river Jordan. And there's the need for them to know the sign, the sign that's going to indicate that they should begin assembling and begin to get in position so that they can begin the journey across the Jordan. And so what's said is that the, the Levites and the priests, or the priests that are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, so... So there's going to be ultimately the dismantling of the, the tabernacle and everything uh, by the different individuals. And then you're going to have the priests that are going to uh, uh, hold the Ark of the Covenant. And the people are instructed to follow at a distance, to follow. Uh, the Bible talks about uh, uh, 2,000 cubits. And so they are to follow at this far distance, a very far distance, uh, 2,000 cubits. We know that cubits, uh, according to what the word of God kind of reveals, it, it talks about how, uh, just to give you a, a visual of this distance, uh, we know that cubits are from, uh, I guess, from the tip of, from the tip of the finger um, of a particular ruler of a nation from the tip of the finger to the elbow. So this would be classified as one cubit from the tip of the finger to the elbow um, of the ruler of a nation. So that's one cubit. So tip technically that would be about a foot and a half or, you know, in my case, I have pretty long arms. So uh, it, it, almost two feet here, almost two feet. Uh, so what we uh, can estimate in that, just to kind of give it a, 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 a distance, a measurement, is so if we were to calculate like, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, let's see here, one cubit, a foot and a half, a foot and a half times 2,000 cubits would be about... 3,000 feet, 3,000 feet. Uh, and, and so if we were to, uh, you know, go on the high side and say it's two feet, you know, so 2,000 cubits times two feet, uh, uh, 2,000 cubits times two feet would be about 4,000 feet, uh, 4,000 feet. And so, so somewhere, so, so we know that 5,000 uh, feet is a mile. 5,000 feet is miles. So it's less than a mile, but more than half a mile. I would say more, at least, at, at least half a mile. So we, I would say somewhere in between 
half a mile and uh, uh, three quarters or 3.5 quarters of a mile. Uh, and, and so so this is a great distance. So that's a, uh, that's a huge distance that you have to uh, look before you and see the direction that the priests uh, and the Levites are, are carrying this ark um, and to follow, to follow, uh, in, to ensure that you know where you're going. And so, so this is what they're instructed. And so this is what begins to happen. After three days, we see that this begins to happen. The priests, you know, begin to take up this Ark of the Covenant, um, you know, this holy thing, uh, this special thing, this thing that goes into the Holy of Holies. This is very important. It represents the presence of God. It represents um, that God is with them. Uh, this is significant. If uh, people can die, you know, for, for mishandling this ark, and, and that has happened in uh, the Word of God. We see that. Uh, in reference to individuals that mishandled the ark and uh, paid with their life. And so uh, we see Joshua commanding the people, commanding the people to go forward, uh, to, to ultimately um, go beyond the river Jordan. And so as the, the, as the, the priests who are carrying the ark, ha as they touch the water, the, the, the river Jordan, as they touch, as their feet rest in the water, the water begins to do something amazing in the likeness of what, uh, in, in, a, in a different way, but in similar way, like it did with the Red Sea and with Moses. Uh, uh, and so this, the, the parting of this river Jordan happens uh, God wants to show himself strong. God wants to uh, exalt uh, the authority of Joshua. God wants to mightily manifest himself. He wants uh, all to know that these are his chosen people and this is their chosen leader. And he wants to uh, in, in he wants to uh, uh, bring about glory to his name. And so he, he does that. And he also tells Joshua that the, the children of Israel, they're going to fear you from this day. The same fear that was that the people had on Moses. He wants the people to have that same fear for Joshua. And so they uh, begin to, you know, so, so the priests who have the ark, they are in the midst of Jordan. They're in the midst of Jordan uh, and the water, the, the Bible says that the water um, rises up like heaps, you know, like uh, heaps in the sense of uh, like things that are stacked on top of each other. We know that the book of Exodus um, in chapter 14, it, it, uh, it talks about that there, there were walls as the, the Red Sea, uh, there were, it was walls to the left and to the right of the children of Israel in that day. And so, uh, it was similar, uh, with Joshua in reference to the Jordan river, uh, to where heaps, it was maybe a wall, uh, uh to their left and to their right, as far as the, the massive, amounts of water that stacked up and the functionality of the river had stopped uh, because God wanted to show uh, that he is the God who is able to work outside of the laws in which he created in reference to the earthly laws, in reference to how God, how the earth functions. He's able to halt it He's able to, to reconstruct. He's able to reverse. He's able to um, cause things to be healed or cause things to uh, be infected. You know, so, so God is in full manifestation here in reference to his power. The priests that are bearing the ark are in the midst of Jordan and the people are now instructed to go past, to go past the the priests who have the ark to walk past them along dry ground 
in the midst of Jordan when, when they can physically see that the waters have stopped around them. They, they, the waters are not flowing. They are halted. And so it's the miraculous hand of God, the powerful hand of God. And so the people are witnessing something that is beyond the laws of the planet. They are obviously awestruck, uh, but there needs to be them uh, ultimately fearing God in the end, as the book says, at the uh, as the uh, chapter says at the end of the chapter, and also at the end of uh, chapter 14, how the people uh, ought to fear the God of, uh, of Moses and the people ought to fear the God of Joshua, uh, that they know that this is the same God, the God that did a miracle in the same way, but different. This time he, he's using priests, he's using priests and he's allowing for the priest to 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 bear uh this ark and it's god who's in the midst of the uh water here and how the water has to halt at the commandment of god at the presence of god uh and the waters in a sense are a manifestation of reverence a, a manifestation of reverence at the at the in the presence of god a god who is represented you know uh by the ark that's in the midst of the jordan river and the uh and and how this is almost uh, like what we see in ezekiel chapter one as far as these cherubim that are bearing the uh the the king of of, of glory that, that are bearing god on top of them as we see the the depiction of that in ezekiel 1 and so this is a type and shadow of that we we see that here we see that here uh, in uh joshua uh and, and and so this is powerful it's powerful in reference to how god uh is able to make himself known through creation and through the uh, handling of the laws of creation through the handling. He, he does things to uh, bear witness of what he is and his authority over all of the creation. And so this is a, a blessing. This is a blessing. It's powerful in reference to the miraculous proving of himself that, uh, uh, God does uh, in the midst of Joshua, in the midst of the people, uh, in the midst of the priests, the Levites. Uh, and he also uh, in chapter, let's read some of the uh, chapter here. He also in chapter three here. Uh, let's go. No, we read chapter three. Uh, we went through chapter three. Let's go to chapter four where he desires uh he's joshua commands that uh 12 men uh where the priests are holding uh holding back the waters with the ark he's commanding that 12 men that represent the the 12 tribes one man from each tribe he's uh, commanding that they grab a stone from where the priests are standing. Grab 12 stones. So one stone per man grabbing the stones. And this would later on be uh, a memorial, a memorial before the people so that the people can know uh, this day what God had done, how God had showed himself uh, strong before the people. And this would be something that would aid in the prompting of them, aid in the obedience towards them fulfilling what God ultimately wants them to fulfill. Uh, hearkening, listening to the law of God, uh, exhibiting the characteristics that ultimately are what God wants them to do. And so all of these things are important for the people 
of Israel to see so that they can know that God is with them and they ought not exhibit fear and they can go and do all that God has said they can do because God is with them, even as, even as God was with them as they were parting the river Jordan. God was in the midst, the priests were around it, and the people passed through because of the power of God. Uh, and so these 12 stones would be taken. And, and so it, it says... Uh, here um, in verse four, then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe and man. And Joshua said unto them, pass over before the ark of the Lord, uh, your God into the midst of the Jordan and take up, uh, take up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, uh, according unto the number of the tribes of of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when the children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan uh, were cut off and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And so, uh, so yeah, so this is a memorial. This is something for remembrance, something to even, uh, perpetually stir up the fear of the Lord for the people of Israel. So they ought not sin against the God of Israel. Uh, and so, and, and as it's uh, plainly said here, that it's for their children who, who didn't witness, who didn't physically witness the, uh, the actual sight uh, of this river Jordan being parted, who didn't physically see, you know, because those, this new age of, uh, individuals that saw this uh, um, uh, river being parted were not the ones that saw the uh, were not the ones that uh, possibly saw the uh, red the 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 river be the the Red Sea being parted by Moses because these were the these were the new the the children of those that were taken away in the 40 year journey through the wilderness that disobeyed God, that did all manner of things that were ungodly before God and were judged with a multitude of different consequences. And so God was ultimately showing them his hand of miraculous works showing these children so that they can have a reference, so that they can have a memorial, so that they can have the uh, physical uh, comprehension of the God that they're dealing with. And so their children would be the ones that they would give the uh, talk of or the story of of what these stones mean, this memorial that God wanted them to establish in order uh, for uh, the, 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 the curious to uh, be given an answer that would bless them. And, and would install the fear of God in them in reference to the capabilities of the God of Israel that deliver them. Uh, because it's, it's not only for fear purposes, but it's also for uh, 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 boasting of the Lord purposes. Uh, not boasting in unrighteousness, but boasting in reference to the acknowledging of the works of God, the talking of the works of God, the the acknowledging, the 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 promoting 
uh, the, the inspiring others uh, to understand the, 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 the God that is able. You know, one of the New Testament scriptures that we love in the book of Ephesians, uh, where it says, unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. So in the New Testament, we know that the Holy Spirit that is working in the sons of God, uh, uh, we know that God, Jesus Christ, is able. He's he's able to do amazing, wonderful, miraculous works that minds cannot fathom uh, to ultimately uh, cause what God has prophesied to come to pass to manifest. He's 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 able to do exceedingly beyond our uh, understanding. So this is why the believer is awestruck of God. This is why the believer is amazed at the God of creation, uh, because uh, this is the this is how he presents himself. There's a reason to why God creates creation in the way that he does. So th the vastness of his creation, the vastness of of the intelligence that he uh, places in the world, the vastness of how architectural uh the natural creation that he creates is like he is so wonderful that the fact that in creation is programmed specific things that they ought to do in order to survive in order to provide in order to uh reproduce after themselves uh in order to do ultimately what god has designed them to do and so it's amazing uh, in the uh, uh, in uh, the, some of the latter books that we're going to explore we see that even King David says something wonderful in reference to he says a word that I love to quote here and there uh, he says uh, how, how God is magnifical magnifical uh, and maybe this oh, that's a word that uh, is uh, a derivative of magnificent or something else or majesty or something, but God is magnifical, uh, which also uh, describes the glory of God, the power of God, the, the majesty of God, the, the fact that God is the one that is able to go beyond the, the thoughts of what man believes that God is capable of. And so that's a, a, a blessing. And so going forward, going forward uh, in, uh, let's see, look at one of the things I wanted to point out that I noticed as I was reading the book of Joshua is that as when the people passed over uh, the river, Jordan, I noticed that it said on uh, it, 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 that they passed over and they were clean over on the 10th day of the first month, the 10th day of the first month. And I know we remember in the past episodes what the 10th day of the first month is. So the 10th day is the day that the, the children of Israel, in reference to Passover, would uh, take a, uh, take a, a lamb or a goat and, and they would take the blood, uh, as we were talking about before, and they would ultimately put the blood on the doorpost and everything for them to, uh, be passed over by the angel of death. And so they clean passed over the river here and and four days later would be Passover because on the 14th day is when they would uh, do what was necessary in order to keep the Passover, the different requirements. I'm not going to go through that again. If you uh, want to hear that, you could reference to the previous uh, episodes in which I um, unfold that uh, in its fullness. But so Passover is what they would have shortly did after uh, the the passing over of the Jordan River on the 14th day of the fourth month. Um, and so that's 
awesome and, and how God works and how uh, God positions things to uh, to to be what he desires them to be. And so um, looking at uh, chapter five, let's let's read some verses here. We've um, talked a lot about chapters one through four on uh, and even detoured a little bit. <laughs> but let's look at uh, let's see here. Chapter five, and, uh, right, chapter one, and it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, uh, so we have more Amorites, we had Amorites, kings that were uh, uh, east of the Jordan River, and now we have more Amorite kings that are west of the Jordan River in the territory that Israel is, is ultimately going to take over. And so it, it says, and it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites which were on the side of Jordan westward uh, and, uh, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, which is westward as well, heard that the Lord had dried up the water waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until we were passed over that their heart melted uh, neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. So they were completely full of fear. They were shaking in their boots. Um, verse 2, And that time uh, the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives and, uh, and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time and Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of, of the foreskins and this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise all the people that came out of Egypt that were males even all the men of war died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt uh, now all the people that came out were circumcised, came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, uh, them, um, them, they were not circumcised for the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the uh, people that were men of war, which came out of Egypt uh, were consumed because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord unto whom the Lord swore uh, that he would not show them the land which the Lord swore unto their fathers that he would give us a land that floweth with milk and honey and their children whom he raised up in their stead. Uh, them Joshua circumcised. They, those were the ones that Joshua uh, circumcised, uh, taking away the excess skin of the male. Uh, for they were uh, for they were uncircumcised uh, because they had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass when they had done uh, had done circumcising all. Um, all the people they that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole, uh, until they were rejuvenated, until they were healed. Um, we know that there's another story in the book of Genesis where, uh, you know, the, the sons of Jacob, you know, took advantage of the weakness of the men of Shechem. You know, uh, they concocted a plan uh, because they were upset with their sister uh, and how uh, upset with how their sister was treated. They thought it was something abominable to them. Uh, Jacob uh, ultimately uh, was going to choose to give the daughter over to the men of Shechem to marry and to be treated as a wife. But... Uh, you know, ultimately they, they uh, use this agreement 
uh, with the men of Shechem in reference to the men of Shechem being circumcised like they are so that they can take the uh, the wives of this foreign land and for uh, the this foreign land to be able to take the wives of their land, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in some sort of unity. Uh, but yet the the sons of, of Jacob, they uh, concoct this plan to, to, to go by night and to destroy all of the men of Shechem. Uh, and so they say they do that while the men are weak, while the men are being healed uh, in their inward parts. They're they're trying to, you know, muster up uh, or, or be healed and, and be strong again. And so they take advantage and, and kill them. And so uh, so one of the special things that it says that I remember it saying in the book of Genesis is that even though that happened and it was something that could have caused Jacob to fear, Jacob, it says that God caused all of the inhabitants around them to fear them, to, to fear them. So there was a fear of the Lord that was on Jacob and the 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 um the seventy some odd persons at the time or whatnot um you know and so they 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 were not pursued by the nations around them they were not pursued they they were because you know that was an that was an act of war you know you 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 go and kill an entire uh, people group and, and you don't think that those, those people group um, people groups are in alignment with other people that will um, come and you know uh, uh, retaliate for um, the uh, uh, the the atrocity that was done against them and, and so God's hand was on Jacob and protected Jacob and his tribe uh, uh, even though even though uh, what was done shouldn't have been done uh, but it was something that maybe God wanted to do as to keep them from mixing with the men and the women and the nation of Shechem Maybe the Lord wanted that and he used that even though it was something uh, that was bad that uh, his sons did, um, uh, 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 Simeon and Levi, even though it was something bad that they did, there was a covering. There was a covering on uh, the, uh, the, uh, Jacob. There was a, a covering on Israel. And so that was... Uh, something that was essential to see here uh, in reference to, you know, God's hand of protection, God's hand of provision, God's hand uh, on people that have the mission of God within them, that have the mandate of God within them, that have the 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 literal uh, signs of the power of God and the mission of God. Uh, with them to execute according to God's provision, according to God's uh, righteousness, according to what God's predestined plan is for the people in which he chooses. And so that's uh, important. So we see here that as it's talking about Joshua, he makes these knives and he ultimately circumcises the men. Um, and so this takes a while. And, and we see even that it's called the, 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 the place is called the um, it, it's the, the foreskins are so much. The excess skin is so much that it's, it piles up like a, a mountain. Uh, the, the hill, the hill of the foreskins. Yeah, yeah, there, there it is. The, um, Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And so this ought to be done because this is something that was established, uh, uh, through Abraham. Abraham was who, 
God began this law of circumcision, this, this task, this responsibility of circumcision through, and we see that it's been something that's been carried out through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, uh, something that was essential for them to hold on to as far as a sign in their flesh of the relationship that they would have with this God, with this God that would lead Abraham through the wilderness and ultimately promise him that his descendants would be as the stars of the skies, as the sand of, uh, of, of the ground. It would it, he would have a mighty blessing on his life, and so that was uh, essential. And so we we see Joshua uh, continuing that. We see the the importance in Joshua uh, mandating that this uh, uh, manifest after they cross over to the land in which God has promised them, so that they can draw closer to the God who is for them. And so uh, so as we uh, continue here, let's read uh, some more here. As we see here in the latter um, of the chapter, God is, is ultimately giving Joshua the plans, the plans to, to come against uh, Jericho. Uh, and he, they're on this pursuit. They're on this pursuit to ultimately take over this specific land. Uh, and so we see here, let's, let's read um, verse 13. Uh, it says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as a captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, uh, What saith my Lord unto his servant and the captain of the Lord's host, uh, the Lord's army, uh, said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place where thou stand is holy. And Joshua did so. And so Joshua has to experience supernatural things that confirm his identity. Joshua is being visited by angels. Jo Joshua has been being. Uh, 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 declared before the children of Israel uh, that he uh, is the one God is affirming through this miraculous event of the River Jordan parting. And so this uh, angel is coming to him, this angel who is uh, possibly a principality, uh, a, a Lord or a, a individual who uh, is over uh, the host, uh, someone who's over a host, uh, the captain of an army in the angelic realm is a, uh, a principality. Uh, we know that there are bad principalities in reference to evil, uh, unclean spirits that are over um, specific other angels within territories. Uh, but we know that there are good principalities uh, in reference to uh, Michael, Michael, who is uh, a individual uh, who is a uh, prince over Israel, who who protects Israel in a supernatural sense. He protects Israel. He fights the 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 enemies of Israel in reference to the uh, the the uh, corrupt unclean spirits in the unseen world uh beyond the sight of men and women uh that come against the mission on the israel uh, on on the land of israel he, he comes again so there's a so there's michael who's in charge of protecting that and so michael has a 
uh, 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 many angels that are with him, that are in charge of the guarding of the children of Israel. So we have the men of war in the physical and we have the angels, angels of war in the spiritual. And so do we have this? We don't know if this specific angel is Michael, but we know that uh, this angel says to Joshua that where he is, uh, is holy ground. So Joshua has to take off his shoes. And so we know that uh, an angel, in a sense, is a conduit, a conduit of of heavenly places. And so there and so depending on the authority of the angel, depending on where they come from, there may be a request like this. You know, Joshua has to take off his shoes because the angel has holiness on him, has uh, authority on him. And in that, there must be the taking off of the shoes. We see the same similar thing happening with Moses. And when Moses, uh, uh, you know, is interacting with the angel in, in the burning bush situation. And so, this is this is the the this is the supernatural miraculous events that we are seeing are a confirmation of what God wanted uh, uh, Joshua to experience that was a a direct uh correlation a, a direct line that connects him with Moses that displays that he is the God that uh, is with Joshua now. And so Joshua ought to not fear. He ought to be strong and of a good courage uh, because God is with him. And so so that's uh, very powerful, very powerful. And so in, so let's proceed to um, chapter six, uh, where, you know, Joshua, uh, you know, ultimately he's, uh, commanding the people to go forward and to pursue Jericho. He's on route to pursue, to destroy Jericho, and God's going to give him instructions on how to do so. And so in verse one, it says, now Jericho was straightly shut up uh, because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. Uh, and so in verse one here, it's talking about the fact that Joshua and the armies uh, besiege Jericho. They camp on the outskirts of Jericho and they besiege it, um, surrounding it, not letting any export or import manifest or happen. So there's no trading because, you know, foreign nations come in and trade, barter, uh, whatnot. Uh, and uh, so that's a way for resources, a way for uh, them to be replenished, to be um, added to. Uh, and so we see that that's something that uh, um, the, the first, a, a, a first um, tactic um, or an assault on a on another nation, we see that they are uh, applying this strategy of, of besieging the city, surrounding the city with the uh, camp of Israel uh, in order to, uh, f you know, ultimately uh, then proceed with the next instructions to ultimately take over the territory and destroy what God wants destroyed and save what God wants saved. And so, uh, we, we see in verse two, it says, and the Lord said unto Joshua, see, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor, the mighty men of valor of, uh, the, uh, kingdom of Jericho here. And ye shall compass, compass, uh, the city, you know, go around the city, all ye men of war and go round about the city once. Uh, thus shall thou do six days. So the first six days, they're going to go around the, the walls of Jericho once. Once uh, for the first six days. And then 
And then it says in verse four, and seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the tr uh, blow with the trumpets. And so it's explained to us that on the seventh day, after six days of going around the city once, on the seventh day, they're going to go around the city seven times. So around the walls of the city, they're going to go seven times. And then is going to be the blowing of the trumpets, the, the seven trumpets by the priest, by the seven priests. And the seventh day, you shall compass the city seven times and the priest shall blow with the trumpets. Verse five, and it shall come to pass that when they make a loud blast with the ram's horn and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet all the people shall shout with a great shout and the wall of the city shall fall flat and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him and Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said unto him said unto them take up the ark of the covenant and the, and let seven priests uh, bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the covenant and he said unto the people pass on and compass the city and let uh, um, him that is armed pass on before the ark of the Lord. And so, so you would have the men of war that would be their guard in the front. Then you would have the priest behind them that would be, would be blowing the trumpet. And then you have the ark and then, then you would have, uh, the, the people and the, the men of war are also behind them, protecting them from any rear attacks, possibly. Uh, and so it continues to say, and the armed men went before the priests and blew with the trumpets and the rearward came after the ark and the priests um, going on and blowing with the trumpets and Joshua had commanded the people saying, ye shall, uh, ye shall not shout nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout until the time you're appointed to shout. You cannot shout throughout any of the first six days. Uh, and even on the seventh day until Joshua says to shout. Um, in verse 11 says, so the ark of the Lord compassed the city going about it once and they came into the camp and lodged into the camp. Uh, and Joshua rose early in the morning and the priests took up the ark of the Lord and the seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets and the armed men went before them and the rearward came after the ark of the lord uh, the priests going on and and blowing with the trumpets and the second day they compassed the city once and uh, returned into the camp so they did six days. And so we see uh, that the order is that the men of war are behind the ark, as it's set, stated here. Uh, and, and so and so we have men that are uh, before the priests that are uh, that have the horn that have the ram's horns. And we have uh, men of war that are behind the ark. Uh, so. So we have two sets here, two sets of men of war. And so uh, it says here, and it came to pass um, at the seventh time when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, shout, for the Lord hath given you the city and the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that 
uh, we sent. All right, so, uh, and I'll keep reading verse 18. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed when ye take of the accursed thing and make a make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Uh, but all silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron uh, are consecrated unto the Lord. Um, they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So that's the purpose for that. So re I wanted to read that as well because we know that Achan is the individual that's guilty of taking these treasures, uh, you know, after they were all told not to take the treasures from within Jericho. So, but before we get to that, you know, we see here that ultimately what happens is there is on day seven, the great shout that manifests after the ram's horns are being blown all at the same time in unison and it's being blown and the uh, joshua tells the people to shout they shout and the walls come they, they begin to crack and they begin to fall um the people that are maybe on the walls or the people that are um are viewing this whole thing that are uh, within jericho they're being shocked you know, they were already afraid. Now this is, you know, a deer in the headlights. This is ultimate destruction befalling them and they're completely overtaken. And so as the walls begin to shake and begin to fall flat before the children of Israel, there is the command to go in and to kill and to ultimately remember to save uh, Rahab, the one who has that scarlet thread, that scarlet rope that is uh, fastened, that's tied to her window, that is an indicator, that is the identifier of who is being passed over, who is not reaping the destruction that is ordained on the the land of Jericho, on this, on these the, these people who who maybe boasted in their high walls. And so this was being destroyed before the Lord because they their land was to be taken uh, because of the perpetual abominations over time that these people, Jericho, and the many people, the surrounding nations exhibited that were uh, horrible, that were an abomination in the sight of God. And so, uh, so yes, so uh, we see that the hand of God, the miraculous hand of God manifests. God uh, brings destruction to Jericho, brings destruction to their structure because man ultimately thinks that physical um, structures, physical resource, physical aspects of of plenty can help them against the God of all creation. The God of all creation, he understands, he knows all things and he uh, ultimately wants to bring man to the place to where they realize that he is the Lord over all things. And if they submit to him, that they will receive a, a great reward for that. You know, the Bible talks about, uh, in reference to the Christians, the Bible says that he that endures, uh, and he that overcomes shall be given a crown of life. And so God wants to show man that life is not what they uh, ultimately perceive in this world. Life is something that is uh, exemplified in this world, but it uh, is something that man ought to use wisely in order for them to obtain the promise of salvation that they are, that they uh, obviously 
uh, truly want in reference to what God uh, can engraft them into. And so we see Rahab, she wasn't satisfied with the life that she had. She knew there was a better life. She knew that there was something else that 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 she could obtain. She knew that uh, this was not all. And so she wanted to be engrafted into the, the, uh, the truth of what she experienced. So she would experience. So she saw destruction coming, but she didn't take the destruction as her end. She took her, she saw, she perceived, she was aware of the way out and she allowed herself to receive knowledge and to be engrafted into uh, what was promised to her uh, through the acts uh, of bravery and obedience that she exhibited. And so this was something very uh, powerful, very um, awesome that God does, that he engrafts someone that is not of the nation. He, he did that with the mixed multitude, allowing them to come along the journey in reference to the children of Israel. And he allows a foreigner again to come with the uh, children of Israel to come into the household uh, of Israel. And she is a, a, a proverb of, of faith, even in the New Testament. And so that's uh, a blessing. And so we see what's said in, let's moving forward to uh, chapter seven. We, we see here uh, that there is uh, something uh, bad that happened, something bad in reference to uh, Achan, who uh, ultimately uh, is someone who uh, offended God, offended the children of Israel by his practice. He practiced covetousness. He practiced this level of, of idolatry, this level of lust in him wanting substance. And he took from the Jericho uh, after he was hypnotized uh, of what he saw. He was hypnotized uh, in reference to what he saw and he pursued it and took it despite the instruction of Joshua not to take anything from it or uh, troubling of Israel would happen, uh, offending God would happen. He did it regardless. And so now the Israel was in jeopardy of, of losing lives, of losing uh, individuals within their camp. And so uh, it says here in, let's jump down to, um, so just to summarize this, because I want to jump, I want to go to uh, verse six, but just to summarize it, uh, you have, they're now going to pursue uh, AI. Uh, and so what happens is uh, Joshua sends, you know, spies to AI as well to see um, what uh, the land is like, uh, uh, what the city is like, you know, so they go to AI and so they see that the, the, the nation is very small. The city is very small. Uh, and so they come back ultimately to uh, Joshua and tell Joshua that, hey, uh, we don't have to use all of our men, all of the men of war to come against them and to take their land. We actually can, you know, just choose, you know, just a few thousand men and go up and take their land because, you know, they're not that impressive. So they size them in reference to their physical status. And they say, hey, no, 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 we can do this. And so Joshua sends, you know, um, the, a number of men of war and they go and ultimately AI beats them. AI beats them because there is an issue with their standing in God. It's an issue because Achan uh, ultimately took of an accursed thing in Jericho and he hid it under his tent. He, he, he um, buried it and he ultimately wanted to keep it. Uh, and he didn't realize, he didn't, uh, you know, ultimately perceive the great problems with what he did. And so what happens then is that 
you know, let, let's look at. So when Joshua hears the news, this forbidden news, how can uh, the children of Israel be beaten? Joshua is told by God that, you know, uh, the, you know, if if he obeys, then he's ultimately going to see the prosperity. He's going to see victory in, uh, anywhere he uh, plants his feet. It's going to be his. He only understands winning. So how does this happen against a small uh, uh, people group that, that his spies assessed? How does this happen? And so in verse uh, six, it says, and Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth uh, upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening tide. Uh, he and the elders of Israel and put dust on their heads. And Joshua uh, said, alas, O Lord God, wherefore hath thou at uh, all brought this people over Jordan to deliver them? Uh, to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Would to God uh, we had been content and dwelt in the other side uh, of Jordan, you know, the other side and where the where some of the people were presently, where, you know, the, 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 the people, the Reuben, some of the people of Reubenites were there, the wives and children and the livestock, uh, you know, the, the, um, the Gadites and the Manassites, the, 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 the children of Manasseh, they were there. And so Joshua was saying, Hey, you know, we don't need, we don't really need all the land. We're content with just being across the River Jordan. If we knew that we were just going to come over the Jordan and just be, you know, smitten by these Amorites, you know, so so he's pleading before God. He's, uh, you know, he's he doesn't understand. He doesn't know why this has happened. This is against what the God of Israel has promised him. So he's trying to reckon. He's trying to figure out what had happened. And so, um, and it's verse eight, O oh Lord, uh, what shall I say when Israel turn their backs before their enemies? You know, what will, what will Joshua say to the children of Israel when their backs, are, when they're being chased by their enemies? What will he, what, what will he explain to them? Because all they know is winning. All Josh, uh, Joshua knows is winning. We don't, we, and they, according to their perspective, they're being obedient. They don't know anything else in reference to losing. And so, uh, and, and so, uh, let's see here, for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall uh, uh, environ us uh round and cut off our name from the earth and what wilt thou do unto thy great name uh, and the lord said unto joshua get thee up wherefore liest thou thus uh, upon thy face israel hath sinned uh, you should have known that something bad happened in reference to your people israel sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them for. They have even taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and dissembled uh, also. And they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies. Because they were accursed, uh, neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed, uh, accursed from among you. Up, sanctify the people, and say, sanctify yourselves uh, again tomorrow. For uh, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. And so, yeah, so so uh, this through a series of of. Uh, you know, through through manifold wisdom, through supernatural direction, uh, Joshua begins to, you know, he uh, on the, the next day, he begins to um, 
you know, call out the tribe of Judah and then the families, you know, from the tribe, um, uh, uh, from the families from within the tribe. And then he begins to narrow down uh, by supernatural um, understanding and he eventually gets to Achan, the family uh, 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 and Achan. And he he asks Achan to be truthful and to give God glory and to admit what he had done to cause Israel to suffer this great loss before the foreign people of Ai. And uh, Achan confesses. He confesses that he took valuable things from Jericho. They took uh, uh, garments, uh, Babylonian type garments, and they took, you know, uh, specific treasure, uh, you know, like it took some, uh, some silver and, and some, some other things. He took these things and he hid it in his tent and buried it, uh, so that he, he wouldn't be found out. And, uh, so then ultimately, uh, Joshua sees that the Lord has revealed this before him. And uh, ultimately what happens is uh, Achan and his entire family has to be killed, has to be uh, destroyed before the Lord because they have touched of the accursed thing. They have touched of what God forbidden the people uh, uh, to touch. Uh, and so it's not that God is against those valuable things. God wants people to adhere to when it's right to obtain, to uh, take these possessions because we know that in the previous uh, episodes that we talked about that it was, you know, a practice. It was okay for them to take servants, for them to take certain valuable things, for them to take certain things as God deemed it was okay for them to take. And in this specific occasion, the, the, the silver and the gold and certain valuable things were to go into the treasury of the Lord. They were supposed to go into the treasury of the Lord. And so it was not for for the men of war to grab uh, and, and to be hypnotized by these things and to ultimately cause themselves to be accursed. In our modern day, there are so many uh, different things that are happening in reference to the world and the people, the cultures that are within the world that are ultimately causing the ways of the world and the accursed things of the world to seem good, to seem right, to seem okay, to seem harmless. Uh, and, and so we know the word of God tells us that there's coming day, even today, uh, and, and it's through, it's been throughout cultures. It's been throughout cultures, throughout time to where what's said in the word of God is that uh, people will say things that are good are bad and say that things that are bad are good. There's there's a shifting of the identity of the uh, of the corruption of a thing. There's a shifting of it. There's a uh, saying that things are good that are bad, things, saying things that are bad that are good. And so we see that uh, throughout uh, our generation. We see that uh, currently and as far as, you know, things are mutating uh, into uh, things that are supposedly good. We, we know that, um, you know, and some people may disagree with this, but you have uh, certain things like uh, the, 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 the drinks, uh, certain drinks, certain energy drinks in this modern day, uh, monster, uh, something, a monster drink. You know, it, it's for, for people, it's something that they should, uh, you know, partake of monster drink. And it has markings on it that look and uh, look like an abomination. You know, it's 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 something that is an accursed thing. It, it's a, an accursed thing. You have uh, uh, other drinks that are called liquid death, liquid death. 
you know, a drink that's called liquid death, it, you know, something that is bad, but yet people are perceiving it as good. You know, you have Christians that might be drinking liquid death. You have Christians that might be drinking, you know, from monster, you know, monster <laughs> injury. You, you know, there's, you know, uh, chips nowadays that are called voodoo chips, voodoo chips. So when is voodoo something that someone would consider good enough for them to ingest and eat? You know, voodoo chips, witchcraft chips, you know, um, you, you have uh, uh, ice cream, rebel ice cream, you know, rebel no, rebel, I, we, we shouldn't consume anything that has the name rebel or voodoo or liquid death or monster. You know, there's so much, there's so much out there, you know, uh, drinks that are describing the, the, the corruption of the culture uh, 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 blossoming to the surface or rising to the surface. I'm not going to say blossom because blossom is a word that describes something good, like a blossoming flower. It's, it's rising like a, a disease to the top. And so, so many, and so people don't think that it's bad. They don't think Halloween is bad. They don't think uh, you know, many things are bad. So things that are bad are turning into things that are supposedly good. And these things are accursed before the Lord. They're cursed because of their identity, the identity, the, 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 this, it's dedicated uh, to corrupt entities. It's, they, they, they assemble these things to 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 uh, to manifest and so you may say well I, I drank one of these things the other day and and nothing happened to me and and so we're, we're not you know trying to so it's not about uh, uh legalism per se it's about understanding that these are seeds that begin to cultivate the curse in a person so what we're saying is that when Christians who are supposed to be enlightened to the truth become ignorant of the subtle approaches of the enemy in the sense, you know, the frog in the, uh, the, the frog in the pot uh, scenario or, or idea to where if a frog uh, jumps into a, a hot pot of water that's boiling, he's going to jump right out because he can immediately sense the, uh, the, the temperature. He can immediately sense that it's real hot, that he has no place, you know, in that pot. But if the frog jumps into a, a pot of water that's, you know, cool, right? Cool pot of water. No drastic temperature differences between the body of the frog and the water that's in the pot. But if you light a fire underneath the pot and slowly get, get the pot's temperature as far as the water within the pot, its temperature to rise, the frog can't adjust, can't perceive and adjust fast enough in order for it to jump out of the pot and survive. And so this is what the enemy wants to do subtly to the people of the earth. Uh, the enemy wants to, to get them to overlook very small things, uh, in order to, to, to manipulate their awareness of the manipulation of the devil and the ultimate snare that the devil is trying to erect. And so this is an importance, there, there's an importance in identifying the accursed thing and acting accordingly, not touching hands away from the accursed thing as to not have the accursed transfer to you 
over time. And so that's something that God is trying to teach us even in the New Testament. He's trying to teach us in order. And so this is why even when you come to Christ, there's a purging of your house. There's an, an anointing of your house, a dedication of, of the possessions that are within your house and your house as a sanctuary for God, as a, a place of safety for God. So there are old things corrupt things, accursed things that we cause, that we throw away, that we we take away from our houses that represented the old us or that represented uh, anything demonic or witchcraft related or, uh, or foreign to your identity, you know, so there's a purging of old things, a purging of specific things to help uh, cause what's in the house to be holy unto the Lord, be pure unto the Lord, be something that is ultimately dedicated unto God. And so there's an anointing of the things that are within your house and there's an anointing of your house uh, with oil if you have it. And this this causes you to spiritually cover, spiritually protect, spiritually uh, uh, purge your home from all access uh, of the enemy uh, to the old things, to the foreign things that you may have. And, and so this is something good. And so we ought to know what the accursed things look like. We ought to know what the accursed things uh, are trying to do. Uh, and, and so uh, because these are the, the these are the devices of the enemy, and so we ought to know this as to uh, retain right fellowship with God, uh, and to be the type of people that are going to help other people to be protected from the corruption that is in the world. And so, so yes, we, we see that. This was something that Joshua had to do. He had to purge Israel of the accursed thing uh, in reference to Achan. And uh, now uh, because of that and the res restoration of the, uh, of the relationship, the restoration of the access, the restoration of power, now he can proceed with the mission. He can proceed with what was necessary uh, in reference to the advancing of the Israelite nation, uh, in reference to the takeover of the surrounding lands, to ultimately give God the glory for what God has empowered the children of Israel to do. So, uh, so we see here going to the next chapter, uh, chapter eight, uh, See here, there is um, ultimately Joshua, he assembles the men uh, because he wants to get back at AI uh, because AI, you know, cause, you know, 30 some odd men, 35, 36 men or whatnot, uh, forget the number, uh, to perish at the first battle when they when they were unaware of you know, Achan's trespass, um, which caused them to trespass. And so now he wants to come against AI and he's coming full force. Uh, so uh, it says here um, in verse one, and the Lord said unto Joshua, fear not, neither be thou dismayed. So he's giving Joshua confirmation, giving him uh, levels of satisfaction. Don't be dismayed. Don't fear anymore. He, you, you can do it. You can do it. You can go ahead and accomplish what I've empowered you and the nation to accomplish. So uh, it, it says... Uh, take all the people of war with thee and arise and go up to Ai. See, I have given into thy hand the king of Ai 
and and his people and his city and his land. And thou shalt do to Ai and her king as thou didst unto Jericho and her king. Uh, only the spoil thereof and the cattle thereof shall ye take for a prey unto yourselves. So he's making sure they understand that, hey, only um, the cattle, um, you know, uh, that you, 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 you're, gonna, you, you're only going to take the cattle um, as a prey here uh, or as a spoil uh, or the spoils of war, the the what you obtain from victory, um, the 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 resources that you get, um, uh, and the the cattle shall you take as a prey unto yourselves. And so he's trying to say the these animals are who you're going to obtain. Lay uh, uh, what what's said here. Lay thee an ambush for the city behind it. So Joshua arose and all the people of war to go up against Ai. And Joshua chose out 30,000 mighty men of valor. He's not going with a, with a low number like he did the first time. He's going with a high number in reference to what God told him. And sent them um, away by night. And he uh, commanded them saying, uh, Behold, ye shall lie in wait against the city, even behind the city. Um, go not very far from the city, but be ye all ready, and I and all the people that are with me will approach unto the city, and it shall come to pass uh, when they come out against us as at the first that we will flee before them. Uh, and so, so God is working in Joshua to give him a plan. And so Joshua is, you know, he's assembling a plan. He, so he's allowing a section, uh, an amount of his warriors, of these, these men of war to, uh, um, he's positioning, positioning them in one place and he's going to uh, make himself manifest in another place. So this is what he calls an ambush. He's going to pretend that he is you know uh, trying to come against them but yet he he he's gonna pretend like he's um cowering in fear he's gonna pretend that hey um you know matter of fact i changed my mind we can't beat these people and so they're gonna try to run away from the men of ai the men of ai are gonna be like oh yeah they're, they're cowering in fear let's run after them let's go and smite them again since they want to show up at our doorstep let's go and uh kill them let's go and take uh, them um captive and make them slaves if possible and, and so what happens is he tells the men to uh, to when uh, he draws the men of AI from their city, he's going to draw them because the men of AI are going to chase uh, Joshua and, and and the the select men that he has, and the the other uh, group of men are the men of war are going to go to the city and they're going to burn the city. They're going to burn the city, and ultimately, what's going to happen is. The men of AI, as soon as they see the smoke like a, a, a furnace rising into the air in reference to their home, their nation of AI, they're going to um, ultimately be afraid. They're, gonna, they're, they're going to not know what happened. They're, they're, they're going to think that Oh man, like, you know, they're going to be startled at this specific war tactic. And the Bible says that ultimately Joshua smotes them. God, uh, God delivers this king uh, of, of Ai and the men uh, uh, into Joshua's hand, into the hand of the Israelites and they win, they destroy. And they, so as God told uh, Joshua, God destroys um, their nation like he ultimately destroyed 
uh, the nation of uh, Jericho, the city of Jericho. And he takes the king, he takes the king of Ai, uh, let's see here, he takes the king of Ai, let me see where it says that. Uh, let's see here. Let's see here. Going down to uh, verse 26. Uh, For Joshua drew not his hand back uh, uh, wherewith he stretched out the spear until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai uh, because they go back and they destroy the city, the, the inhabitants as well. Only the cattle um, and the spoil of that city, Israel, take for a prey unto them. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, so it's the cattle um, and the spoil. So they, they were able to take of the land. They were able to take other. They were able to take the spoil and the cattle. The, the cattle is spoil, and as as well as any other things that they desire in the land, they were able to take that as well. So, um, according unto the word of the Lord, which He commanded Joshua, and Joshua burnt Ai and made it a heap uh, forever, even a desolation unto this day. And the king of Ai, he hang on a tree until evening tide. And as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they should take his carcass down from the tree and cast it, uh, at the entering of the gate of the city and raise thereon a great heap of stones that remaineth unto this day. Uh, then it says Joshua built an altar unto the Lord God of Israel uh, in Ebal. And so that was that's uh, important for us to also uh, acknowledge and for us to bring out because we remember that name, uh, Mount Ebal, from the book of Deuteronomy and reference to what uh, Moses did uh in 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 reference to the curses the the blessings and the curses so the, uh they were on mount gerizim and mount ebal and in the valley uh in between uh there is uh the the priests and the levites uh, and there is the proclamation of the, the, the blessings and the curses. And so six tribes would acknowledge the blessings and six tribes would acknowledge the cursings. And it, so like, like that, it says, then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord of Israel in Mount Ebal, um, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones, over which no man hath lift up any iron, uh, and they offered thereon burnt offerings unto the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And he wrote there unto the stones uh, a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel and all Israel and their elders and officers and their judges stood on the side of the ark and on the side um, before the priests and the Levites, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, uh, as well as the stranger, as he that was born among them, ha half of them over against Mount Gerizim and half of them over against Mount Ebal. Um, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded them before that they should bless the people of Israel. And so, so yeah, so, so we see that uh, this was important as well. So there's important rituals, important things that God was doing through uh, Joshua. God wanted 
uh, to ensure that Joshua did it and, and Joshua knew to do it with a certain pattern, with a certain uh, way. Uh, and he did it as he saw Moses did it. He did it and he uh, ultimately fulfilled it in order to ensure that God would be pleased with the sacrifice of Israel, with what Israel uh, ultimately committed unto the Lord. And so that's what that's what we're seeing. So we're seeing God showing himself strong, God uh, miraculously uh, allowing them uh, to win uh, su uh, victories uh, supernaturally. Um, he's, he's doing great things, uh, parting uh, rivers before them, uh, you know, uh, causing their enemies to even hear of their track, rec track record of victories and the enemies cowering and causing them to, uh, you know, ultimately reclaim the land, the, 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 to, to reclaim the very land that God had promised Abraham, uh, that God gave to Abraham. Uh, and, and they're doing that with, with the, uh, the, uh, ex, uh, the exemplifying of, of strength and courage. And so God tells them that so that they can exhibit that as they do what God has ordained them to do. And in verse nine, uh, I'm sorry, in chapter nine, chapter nine, we're seeing uh, things happening. The people are ultimately fearing uh, the, the Israelites. They, 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 are, they heard of what happened as we talked about with the crossing of the, 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 the Red Sea with Moses. Uh, they heard of what happened with the the dismantling of the, uh, certain kings on the east side of Jordan, uh, you know, Sihon and Og, and they 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 heard what happened with Jericho uh, and its king. They heard what happened with Ai and her king, and so now. Uh, the foreign nations, these nations that are in the uh, land of Israel, this land which belongs to the children of Israel, even though it has not been fully obtained by them yet, this land is theirs. And so they are uh, beginning uh, to uh, uh, go for They're going forward and they and the people are now trying to to concoct other plans. Uh, now we see uh, nations wanting to collaborate with each other, nations that may have been at war with one another or been rivals with one another. Now they're concocting plans to come together. So we have five kings that are going to come together as to try to uh, hinder the move of God on Joshua and Israel's life. They, they're going to try to hinder that, but God is going to ultimately do a miraculous work to, to show the kings of the earth that there's no resistance, no protection against the God of Israel and uh, the, the people of God. Uh, and so, uh, so as we uh, see here, uh, before we even get into that, there, there's uh, something that happens. And so as we're talking about the concocting of plans, we see that not only are the foreign nations concocting plans in reference to the joining with one another, the leaguing with one another in order to come against Israel and Joshua, which their names are being widespread proclaimed throughout the lands as unstoppable uh, machines that are ultimately, you know, tearing down kingdoms as they proceed forward. Uh, and, and so we have another nation, the, the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites, they have their plan and their plan, the Gibeonites, what they do is they um, have a plan to send some people from, um, uh, uh, you know, from Gibeah. And, and, and so they 
have a plan to basically uh, act as if they come from a super far land, a, a, you know, a foreign land that's far away. And so they're going to dress themselves in very torn clothing, old clothing. They're going to have old, you know, bottles, maybe old wineskins, you know, that are worn out, um, that show signs of travel. And so they're, they're going to come very meek and humble. And they're going to uh, ultimately petition Joshua and the children of Israel to to accept them. They ultimately come and tell Joshua um, that, you know, they're uh, Joshua's servants. They, they, they heard of the, the, uh, the fame across the land. They heard of what the God of Israel uh, was doing through um, Joshua and uh, uh, the children of Israel and what God had ultimately did as well through Moses. Uh, and, and so they are trying to create a league, a covenant. They're trying to create an agreement uh, between um, Joshua and the Israelites to save themselves, to save their people. And so Joshua doesn't know their ultimate motives. He, he doesn't know the ultimate truth that they're actually not from far away. They're from, uh, they're, they're, they're very near. They're near uh, to the children of Israel who's acquired new lands in reference to Jericho and Ai. And so th these people aren't you know, people from far away. And so Joshua and the children of Israel, they, they don't, the, the elders, they don't consult God in reference to this. They don't ask God whether God should um, allow them to make a covenant or, you know, some type of union with these foreign people. Uh, because as, you know, you know, and so because they don't inquire, they are in a sense deceived into, uh, believing that this is an okay transaction it's an okay union and so they go ahead and make this union uh and they later find out a few days later they find out that these people aren't from afar they're actually from uh they're near and so what happens is you know joshua comes uh to the people uh, and, and he, he tells them, hey, you know, you, you've lied. You, you've um, uh, beguiled me. You you've, uh, um, were not uh, truthful in your expressions as far as what you uh, were uh, portraying. And because uh, and, and, they, you know, they had the whole scheme. They had everything. You know, they had the clothes. They had, you know, they, they really thought of this. They thought it out. And, uh, you know, they ultimately explained in the end that, hey, we see what your God is doing. And we know there's really no, um, you know, coming against your God and your people. So, you know, you know, some people in the world, there's a slogan in the world is, is if you can't beat them, join them, you know, <laughs> if you can't beat them, join them. And so they had that mentality, you know, so they went ahead and uh, concocted a deceptive plan to join them. But they ultimately, as Joshua uh, stated, that they would become hewers of wood and carriers of water they would be slaves they would be servants and they were ultimately content with that because they knew that it was either slavery or death and uh because the god of israel uh was coming to judge the people in the lands that were ultimately participating in sin uh and defiling the land. So it was time for them to be, uh, uh, you know, eradicated and for the lands to be given to people 
that were ultimately uh, from God, that had the law of God working in them, that that had the righteousness of God working in them, so that uh, they can, you know, uh, be the image of God in a sense in the lands in the world. And so, so yeah, so these Gibeonites, the Gibeonites, they um, deceived their way into a covenant which caused them to be protected. And so Joshua knew and the elders knew that they could not kill the Gibeonites. They couldn't kill these people. You know, they had to uh, just uh, uh, affirm the, the, the covenant that they made. They had to stay true to it or God would may, God may have, uh, you know, ultimately punished them for, uh, you know, being deceptive, even though they were lied to in deception. Uh, because, uh, you know, in the, in the New Testament, uh, uh, we know uh, that we ought to love our enemies. We, we can't treat people that treat us bad, bad. We, we, the, the Bible talks about how in the New Testament, how we have to endure evil patiently. It, it says that you have to love, love. You, you have to uh, uh, do things that represent the fact that God is within you, that God is uh, 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 the one in which uh, operates in a way and you are a extension of the ways that God operates. And so uh, we see even the Old Testament, you know, uh, Joshua had to adhere to that, to, 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 to certain truths that were a reality in reference to honoring uh, that covenant that he um, agreed to. And so, uh, so yeah, <laughs> That's a, uh, funny in a sense, but not. Uh, so so in, in chapter 10, I think chapter 10 is where we're going to end for tonight. Uh, but chapter 10 is a very powerful chapter, uh, very, very powerful chapter in reference to God showing his miraculous handiwork through man. Uh, you know, as we were talking about just a, a few minutes ago, in reference to the fact that you have uh, some people, uh, some nations like the Gibeonites that want to make agreements in order to protect their lives. And so you have other uh, nations that want to assemble together, may have once been, uh, you, you know, uh, rivals. But now, in order to come against this huge wrecking ball of an Israelite people, they need to assemble together to amass a great number of people to come against uh, the children of Israel. And so we see that God is going to do something miraculous in this. Uh, and so it says um, uh, in verse 1 of Joshua chapter 10, it says, Now it came to pass uh, when uh, Adonai... Uh, uh, Adonai Zadok, uh, Adonai Zadok, king of uh, Jerusalem, uh, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it. And he had done uh, as he had done to uh, Jericho and her kings. So he had done to Ai and her king and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them that they feared greatly because Gibeon uh, was a great city. So these Gibeonites that had this, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, hey, we, our, their, their plan, their scheme was if you can't beat them, join them. And so that made uh, the the, the uh, this Adonai Zadok made him afraid, um, made him you know begin to concoct this plan as we see is going to unfold. Um, uh, because he knows Gibeon is a huge city, as it's saying, a great city, you know, uh, royal cities, 
and so for them to bow to that degree, uh, it, it, you know, was like, wow, uh, we have to do something here, you know. And so it says here, wherefore Adonai, Adonai Zadok, king of uh, Jerusalem, sent unto um, uh, Horham, king of Hebron, unto Piram, king of uh, Jar, Jarhath, Jarhath, and unto uh, Jep, Jepiah, king of Lachish, and unto uh, Debir, king of Eglon, saying, come up with me, uh, or come, uh, come up unto me and help me, uh, that we may smite Gibeon, for it hath made peace with Joshua. They betrayed us. Let us come against this Gibeonite people that that sold out. <laughs> and um, uh, therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of uh, Hebron, the, 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 the king of uh, Jar, uh, Jarmoth, the king of Lachish and the king of Eglon um, gathered themselves together and went up, they and all their hosts, and encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua. So the men of Gibeon are sending uh, messengers unto God, J Joshua to 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 ultimately come and help us, come and protect us. Uh, uh, so verse six, and the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp of uh, camp to Gilgal, saying, uh, "Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up to us." quickly and save us and help us for all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, fear them not for I have delivered them into thine hand. All five kings. Uh, uh, there, uh, there shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all, all night, uh, from Gilgal all night. And the Lord discomforted them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, at Gibeon and uh, chased them along the way. Uh, that goeth up to Beth Horon and smote them with uh, smote uh, smote them to uh, uh, Azica and unto uh, Mikeda, and it came to pass as they fled uh, from before Israel and were in uh, the going down of Beth Horon that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Aska, uh, Azka, and they died. They were more, uh, they were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in that day when the Lord delivered up the Ammonites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand still upon Gibeon and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? Uh, so the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hast not to and haste not to go down upon uh, down about the whole day. And there was no day like that day uh, before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of the man for the Lord fought for Israel. And so this 
was amazing uh, because we see that the Lord wants the children of Israel to witness, to be a part of, and to execute the miraculous. God desires to override the existing laws that men trust in, that women trust in, that the world uh, sees as um, absolute and no way around. Uh, but yet there are men, multiple dimensions and uh, things in which uh, God can see that man cannot see. God wants to give favor to his people. He wants to uh, work on behalf of his people. He wants to, he wants to, as we said before, show himself strong through his people that listen to him, that obey him, that walk in his ways. He wants to uh, enable the nations to see the favor that's on the sons and daughters of God. He wants the nations to witness this. He wants to do things so that the people can know that they are of his 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 grace of his power they they he, they are the people that he works for because they work for him and so uh with Joshua he says son stand still he, he sees the hand of God he sees the fact that these stones are not hitting any of the children of Israel they're hitting the enemies, these stones that are coming from heaven. We, we don't know whether it was God just that just um, uh, allowed that or whether it was God that sent angels to do that supernatural work to where angels were probably, you know, throwing these stones from high above uh, and, and causing them to ultimately hit the enemy. And, and so it, it was a, a, a miraculous uh, uh um, fact that the that the testimony here is that there is more that were killed from these stones, from these hailstones that were coming down, than there were uh, the, the 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 children of Israel that killed them with the sword. This is such it's it's so miraculous because when you're fighting with a sword. The person is feet or or maybe inches or just a foot or few feet in front of you. And for the stones, for the hailstones to miraculously hit the enemy and not mistakenly hit the children of Israel. No one being uh, uh, killed by the hailstones that were of the ch children of Israel, but everyone uh, that God wanted to kill of the enemy being annihilated by the hailstones and, and God uh, 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 r representing the power and the authority and the favor that is on Joshua and the children of Israel. And, and, and none of them, uh, as God had stated, could stand before them, even though their numbers had to have been far greater their numbers were had to have been exceedingly greater, like five kings and their armies against Joshua and the children of Israel. That was grossly, they were grossly outnumbered, you know, but yet God was able to give them the victory. And now the children of Israel are about to take over after one battle five kings territories you know uh, you know the 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 children of israel are about to be appointed more land you know uh and so that's that's powerful and we're going to see what it says here in verse 16 in reference to the kings it says but these five kings uh and and hid themselves uh but these five kings fled and hid themselves in a cave at uh makita and in and it was told Joshua saying the five kings are found hid in a cave at Makeda and Joshua said roll um, great stones upon the mouth of the cave and set 
men by it for to keep them and stay ye not. Uh, but uh, but pursue after your enemies and smite the hind the hindmost of them. Uh, suffer them not to enter into their cities for the Lord your God hath delivered them into your hand and it came to pass when Joshua and the children of Israel had made an end of slaying them with a very great slaughter till they were consumed that the rest which remained of uh, of them entered into the fence cities and all the people returned to the camp uh, uh, camp to Joshua at Makeda in peace. Uh, none moved his tongue against any of the children of Israel and uh, said Joshua open. Uh, then said Joshua open the mouth of the cave. And so, yeah, so this victory is awesome. This victory was awesome and how God uh, manifested himself. Uh, you know, in a spiritual way, in a phys spiritual slash physical way on behalf of the children of Israel uh, and how God listened to the voice of a man and allowed time to freeze, allowed time to be halted to where uh, they were able, the sun stood still, uh, the moon, uh, to where things did not function according to natural laws that something supernatural just happened and it caused the 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 earth to to listen to listen at the command of God because God listened to the to to the voice of a man and so that is uh powerful and so God uh is not afraid of giving authority. He's not afraid of giving authority because he's, he loves those who love him, who exercise obedience towards him, who, who are faithful to him. And, and so when it comes to these supernatural miraculous things, he gives them to the faithful. He allows the faithful to see them. He allows those who, who are dedicated in covenant with him uh, to see supernatural, miraculous things. And so they uh, notice the changing of the way things work because of them. And so their, uh, uh, their, their uh, thought when they see these things are not confusion. Their thought is, oh, God's at work again. God is doing a miracle. See, they 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 live a lifestyle. So Joshua lived the lifestyle of this. He lived the lifestyle of this miraculous, you know, this this the the aspects of God just working on his behalf, doing supernatural things for him and the children of Israel. And so we we see. Uh, I'm going to end here where he. Uh, commands them to op open the cave here and he's going to teach a le he's going to uh show uh the younger uh individuals a lesson here the younger in individuals a lesson he's going to give them a courage because god is always talking to him about being uh, being strong and of a good courage so he's about to administer and minister courage to y the younger men here uh, then jo then said Joshua, open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings unto me out of the cave. And they did so and brought forth those five kings uh, unto him out of the cave, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmoth, the king of Lachish, uh, and the king of Eglon. And it came to pass when they brought out those kings unto Joshua, that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said unto them, Capt uh, men of Israel, and said unto the captains of the men of war, which went with him, come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And uh, they came near and put their feet on upon the necks of them. And Joshua said unto them, fear not, 
uh, nor be dismayed. Uh, be strong and of a good courage for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. And afterwards, Joshua smote them and uh, slew them uh, and hang them on five trees. And they were hanging upon the tree until the evening. And so uh, we see here that uh, these kings these five kings that were slain uh they these are kings of renown these are kings that probably have accomplished great things these are kings that have great influence and that have established all sorts of 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 uh, of feats they they've done so much things um they've acquired so much wealth and and uh certain things and so Joshua was giving his uh, his his leaders, the people uh, that were at war with him. He's giving them the chance. These young individuals. He's giving them the chance to step on the necks of these kings as a spiritual sign, as a uh, uh, a manifestation of what God is going to do through them as they obey, as they uh, attack these four nations that, uh, are, uh, that are appointed to destruction. And so the, the, you, you, can, you can tell, you can understand that it's uh, invigorating, it's, it's uh, 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 courage building. It's, he says, Joshua tells him to, you know, to be of good courage and to be strong, uh, to not be dismayed, not be fearful. He's telling them to be strong because they're, uh, they're appointed to do this to even greater Kings. And so when these young men are stepping on the necks of these men of renown, in a sense, they are being internally strengthened. Their identity is being cultivated. Their identity is being built. The, the power is being uh, uh, generated within them. Confidence in the God of Israel is being uh, established and cultivated. And so that's something that God is trying to show the children of Israel and he's trying to show the New Testament Christian you know uh, the levels of courage and strength and ability that they will be able to execute as long as that they remain faithful and uh, uh, full of the desire for God and for his work for what he wants them to do and so he's going to allow them, to do things that they never thought that they could do, to speak to people that they never thought that they would speak to, to heal and deliver and cast out devils and, uh, uh, um, you know, raise the dead, um, heal the sick. He's going to allow them to prophesy, to hear from him and to say things about the future. He's going to allow them to do mighty miracles and works. And so Joshua is appointed his allotment of, of the miraculous and the New Testament Christian is also, also is allotted his portion, his uh, level of grace to walk in the miracle, uh, the miraculous, to live out the miraculous and to exhibit the works that demonstrate that God is the God of miracles, uh, being strong and of a good courage, exemplifying the miraculous life in obedience and being able to take territory, take the territory that the enemy has stolen uh, because even in Joshua's day, yes, they stole that land. That land is not theirs. It's not theirs. Uh, it's only for the faithful. And in the New Testament, you know, we're not about taking land as far as physical land. We're, we're about taking 
uh, territory in reference to the souls of men. God, Jesus Christ tells us that he wants to make us fishers of men. And so this is what God ultimately is doing in the New Testament, uh, causing the kingdom of God to be erected in the souls, in the uh, bodies of people so that the people can inherit eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ as God has appointed for uh, people to have, retain, and to ultimately inherit in reference to the kingdom of the living God. And so, so yes, this is uh, the uh, so far the, the, the first 10 chapters of the uh, book of Joshua. And so God is doing a miraculous work. So remember, the miraculous, uh, be strong and of good courage, and the taking of territory is what the book of Joshua is about. Uh, and of course, there are a multitude of other things as well, but there is a, a pronouncing of those specific things that are all through the book of Joshua. And so we're going to continue uh, next time uh, in reference to the latter end of the book of Joshua so that we can uh, in, uncover more truths of what God is doing, what God did through these people, because we, we are witnessing uh, these are uh, uh, what the Bible calls in the New Testament, uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, these are individuals that are a cloud of witnesses, a cloud of witnesses. Uh, you know, you, you, Joshua, he's a, an example. Moses is an example. A Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they are examples. They are among the multitude of of clouds, of uh, the multitude of witnesses that are like a cloud. They're, because there's so much, there's so much, there's so many examples, so much. So they're a cloud of people, a multitude of people, uh, because they have a multitude of examples of this engaging of the God of Israel and retaining uh, the, the promise within them that God was ultimately going to prove and give them in the end in, in reference to their inheritance. So, so yes, God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. So God bless you. And as I always say, feet follows focus. So focus on Lord Jesus Christ and your feet, my feet, our feet will follow in the name of Jesus. See you next time. God bless you.